the changes would be is uh, you will actually use some improved algorithms and you basically have the, um, uh, you want to provide some resilience so when failure occurs, you can recover from those failures. But, but essentially, the goal is to, um, uh, you, you know, these visualization analysis pipelines inside your simulations uh, memory space. Um, so I'll talk about VTK a little bit. VTK actually is, uh, uh, is one of the tools that can be used to be utilized by the scientific community and stands for visualization toolkit. Uh, started 20 years ago by Kitred. It's an open source VSD license uh, product. And um, in the simulation um, open source space, there are two products. There's Visit, which is from Berkeley. Uh, well, actually, Lua, I should say. And the other one is from uh, the Kitred uh, product, which is the Paraview. And they're both open source products. They look into the large data visualization and analysis. And they both use VTK underneath um, for their, all of their visualization uh, needs. So, contribution to VTK came from multiple sources, Trendia, Livermore, uh, and other uh, national labs, including Kitra as well, and some other um, universities and other uh, partners. So, it's not necessarily all the Kitra code, but VTK actually has these underlying structure so you can do your geometry and volume rendering and can take advantage of the uh, GPUs um, by providing you all the programmable the program pipeline that has been introduced since 2007 or 6.6 6 actually uh, in the um, graphics community. So you have the basic uh, common code um, which actually is um, has multiple components uh, for rendering, uh, filtering, and um, the other components, the utilities you need to do uh, processing for the scientific data sets. The reason we have OpenGL and OpenGL2 is OpenGL1 is OpenGL1 was used to be and now OpenGL2 is a programmable pipeline, so they can want to have the latest changes in the graphics uh, since the last uh, 10 years. Um, with these recent changes, what happened was that the, uh, the performance has gone much faster. So the geometry processing and the volume rendering has gone um, 100 times and two times faster than before. And now there are uh, newer algorithms that could be done uh, in our uh, current running parallel, including contourings, um, imposters, and, and other algorithms. So there has been a, a huge uh, push into the performance and use utilizing the, the recent technologies for the visualization. The Paraview I mentioned is the tool, so apart from Visit, Paraview is another tool that uses VTK and you can do large data visualization by uh, doing parallel rendering. And um, I'll show in the next slide that it actually has the three components, uh, the data server, the render server, and the client. So data server is where you can do lot, lot of your data processing. The end is where you can do parallel rendering, and then client is where you can visualize your data. So this is what we have been doing so far. Um, and this is similar to what other uh, tools are doing in the open source community as such. Um, and they've been producing a lot of these kind of tool visualizations for the scientific assets uh, over the last few years. But as we going to the these exascale space, now we need to figure out like you know what we can do to still do all of these nice visualizations analysis, um, but not uh, uh, not block the users or researchers by the limitations of iOS and the storage space. So there are two kinds of uh, methods right now um, at a higher level. One is that you are running actually um, there's no data transfer. So basically you have these blue blocks that are actually uh, space or the course available for the institute analysis and visualization. Or you can do in transit where you can, you're still running in the uh, same process or that job, but you now actually have a dedicated course um, and you do have to move some data around to those cores even though they are part of the same cluster. So there are two variations here. And these two variations are independent of the tool you're using, whether you're using Paraview or Visit or something else. These what the community is doing 
at large right now. So I can only talk about like what we have done um, in this space is so we use Paraview, uh, or our collaborators use Paraview, and what they do actually is that they load their data set here uh, on your right hand side, and they create a pipeline that basically says that okay, you know, do you load this data set, you apply this particular filter, uh, which may do certain operations, and then um, you export that small uh, workflow or the pipeline that you have created as a script uh, that's shown here in the middle. Uh, which this tells the institute uh, analysis that this is what I would like to inject into the system. And then you basically import this script into something called Paraview Catalyst, which is the institute version of the Paraview. And then that script gets run on your uh, simulation pipeline. So it's essentially, at a very high level, you can think of like in a graphics pipeline where they introduce these programmable shaders and can introduce these small snippet of program in the whole pipeline. And when you're in the whole pipeline, this your program will also get run in the same space. It's a very similar idea, but now it's for the visualization and for the simulation space. So the concepts are at a very high level are similar, but it's newer for the visualization, um, at, as if it had been newer for the graphics pipeline 10 years ago. So you can see the, uh, this chart here shows the, uh, the right time, the, the end of time, and, and other uh, operations like how long it took. And you can see that the right time has been very small. Um, the most of the time you are actually spending is on the uh, data generation. Um, so your actual visualization time or any other data movement time has been minimized in this, in this particular aspect. And as we are going, and these are some examples that has been done uh, from our collaborators. So this is the Oregon National Lab. Um, and I don't know what the, uh, this particular simulation uh, slash visualization they have been doing, uh, but you can see uh, that they have been using um, the IBM um, uh, Blue Gene, I believe, uh, that they've done the simulation slash institute and, and produce these. Um, visualizations um, as it's uh, seen in different timestamps. So the institute has been um, getting more attention and, and that's what people are uh, going or uh, are going to be using forward uh, because as we have more data produced by simulations and as we have these other challenges coming up um, with the large data generations or very complex simulations, uh, seems to be that it's still is a good, it's providing a good solution for these problems. Does that say one million MPI ranks? Yeah. So a million core? I believe so. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. So, the, uh, this little slide shows the, um, different outputs have been produced. One thing actually that I don't have time to talk about today, but the other thing actually they have been doing is uh, they, so since they are producing the visualization, which could be essentially an image, what they are doing actually is that they can capture multiple images of the same data at different angles, different parameters, and then they can create a database of these images which they can composite after your simulation has been run. So you can write a very simple web client or desktop client that can actually take these images and do composite things to, to, to kind of make you feel that like you're actually doing uh, these post hoc analysis where you can read your data set and look at the data set at different angles, different parameters. And they have been very successful in doing that actually as well. So there's another interesting aspect where they call it uh, the um, uh, this particular thing that's coming from the um, uh, Lanel is called Cinema, where you can do those kind of stuff, get different all images, do composing, do visualizations, and, and share the results with the, your other collaborators. And that has been a huge success, uh, at least for the uh, these community at large, where they are looking into these uh, sharing collaboration as well as uh, composting um, as, as needed um, workflows. 
Um, this is again some showing some examples where uh, the the other team I picked where and I do not know which team is this one here, but they have actually designed the um, the simulations which is by by part uh, with the catalyst and produce some interesting results which is shown on the right hand side. And I don't have much uh, information on the page, but basically it's bus, using bus before they have produced um, this is the different kinds of uh, institute where they do in transit plus bus buffers to produce the um, institute uh, analysis and visualization. Um, there's another interesting thing actually that's happening. Uh, it's called BTKM, and actually BTKM is not um, something that actually uh, built by one team. It's it's a collaboration from uh, Sandia. Um, Berkeley, um, Livermore, and other uh, labs as well. And the idea here is that as things are evolving, uh, GPUs, um, Intel, multi-core, multi-core, how we can use these accelerators for the visualization for the next generation. So VCAM is a collaborative effort, and they have been coming up with this, uh, uh, this pipeline where you can do these parallel executions, and this is the um, how it's led to the institute. So you have your filters, which could be contouring or could be essentially uh, slicing or clipping, and you have this kind of you define your worklets, which um, essentially are the uh, implementation um, or backend implementation specific details on how you can run those algorithms in parallel on your uh, underlying infrastructure, whether it's a GPU, GPUs or, or Intel main cores. So again, the idea here is that you have this control environment, which for the user sees, you have these device adapters, which what developers write, and then you run this into a, the execution environment, and that gets run and produce your uh, results, uh, which you can see uh, afterwards. So again, this is something that's coming out, uh, had been developing for the last, uh, I would say, four years, and now actually we start deploying these things, uh, and now this will be available to like visit and grab you in the future. Um, so again, um, this is some of the results that they have compared with the how this piece, uh, Institute and uh, VCAM outperform the traditional MPI. So these are some of the numbers that have been shown. Um, some of the numbers, you see that the EVL, uh, E-A-V-L here at the bottom, um, that's actually a, uh, another implementation of these uh, parallel algorithm uh, execution for visualization. And now EVL and, and VTCAM, they actually merge the code base, I believe. So now VTCAM actually has the entire infrastructure that has been produced by the other national labs. Uh, but this was the previous uh, results that they compared, again, different, um, different systems at the time, uh, which also includes, I believe, the optics plan, which is from the NVIDIA. So that was a very classic example where they compared the results of optics prime, which is highly um, optimized for the NVIDIA hardware, and then how that result compares to VTKM, which is a general purpose. So it is slower than the optics <coughs> prime, um, as you can see, but but from all practical purposes, it's good enough uh, because it provides you the general infrastructure to run on multiple systems as opposed to be running on the, on the NVIDIA hardware. So this is the second part of my talk, um, the geospatial and climate data visualization. Um, so I'll pause for a second if I explain the question at this point. Um, the institute part is very interesting, and, and a lot of people uh, have been contributing. And if you are more interested in that, um, there is a uh, specific topic as part of what I believe is. It's called ADAP. Um So last year they had a very um, big present, uh, discussions on the institute analysis and visualization, and. This year, I'm hoping the same thing is going to happen. So if you're interested, look into those LDAP links and, and see uh, if there's something interesting that you can, you can find and you know, share with the community as such. So the 
this part is more is when I'm more involved with um, variety. Um, so geospatial visualization, the climate visualization, has been evolving, um, and you may have seen a lot of these tools coming out uh, for the last few years. Um, and one thing that would be um, common across these tools is that they're trying to use hardware explanation as much as possible, which means that the GPUs that are underneath on the client side, on the system, on, on the laptops, basically these, all these tools are trying to utilize that uh, to offload all the computations locally as opposed to on the server side, uh, especially for these interactive analysis. And uh, I mentioned the tools here, D3 Geo, so if you know D3, it's a very popular InfoBase library that's been produced by Stanford um, back in uh, six years ago, I believe. Uh, 2JS is a gaming library, a uh, gaming side visualization library. Plotly is for the 2D plots, mostly does some 3D plots. Um, VTK.js is the port of the VTK for the web. So there are a lot of tools that are coming out. And there are a lot of interesting tools, but what's common, and I'll talk about that a little bit, is that how they're utilizing these underlying um, improvements to the web. Um, graphics or web rendering. So why we built this something called GeoJS? So GeoJS actually came from the, so we received uh, an award from DOE uh, to, to visualize the climate data streams and educate people about that. And at the time, just like five years ago, we looked into Google Maps and some of the tools out there, open layers, for example, and we found that these tools are designed for business or for GIS you can show them points and locations and things like that. But they're not designed for the scientific visualization. They don't really accurate in form. They don't really accurately within the data set. They were very limited by the size of data that you can produce or show on a map. So we, we say, okay, we want to create something which could be utilized um, by the community. And can, we can try to bring in these tools as they fit into this particular need for our visualization. And I'm not the expert by any means, but this is the way I see it, is that you have InfoWays, you have GIS, you have geovisualization, which um, essentially is um, can be seen as um, visualization of your climate data set. And then you have this scientific visualization, um, which traditionally has been like contouring, slicing, flipping, those algorithms, streamlines. So this is kind of the array of different systems that exist and how we can bring them together because we need to have these things all together nowadays to, to show the complete, um, or to provide a complete analysis of your data sets. So some of the highlights that we did actually, and, and that's true or relevant for other tools as well, is that um, we produce the visualization at scale. So the idea was that we produce a large data, or show large data on the client side. And we produce the vector graphics. So there's a, traditionally there's a raster graphics and vector graphics. So vector graphics is actually like PDFs. You can see, you can zoom in, and you can still see crisp text and everything else. So how do you provide very crisp rendering of those things on the browsers? And how we can actually take advantage of the hardware at the same time? So that has been a challenge. And, but the algorithms that we actually have used or developed uh, these are not new algorithms, we just basically made this work in a web environment. So, we performed all these optimizations um, that actually are designed for these uh, geospatial visualizations. And the idea was that the, you want to provide an API where you can have the, uh, not the GIS expert or the visualization expert, create data with as few lines as possible. The code has to be compact. Uh, but it doesn't have to be too compact or too abstract so that, that people will have a steep learning curve. It has to be a balance between abstraction and the compactness. So some of the use cases that we did um, is, this is the uh, New York taxi data set. Um, so this is the 114 million taxi and bike trips. This is a public data set released by New York City. So we want to see the patterns, how the bikes and road uh, taxi trips happen 
at a particular given time or in a day or maybe a month. So we did these kind of visualizations using uh, GeoJS flood maps to see how the rising sea level will affect the coastal areas, um, the biosurveillance, um, how we can see, can we showcase these um, uh, disease outbreaks or, or the factors that may affect that in a map. Um, biomedical, so looking into large, uh, so these new instruments have been producing these uh, 3D stack, very high resolution 3D stack of the cells, um, pathology data sets, so we, how quickly can visualize those things on the web. So again, same, same technology, different data sets. Um, this is a feature. So the like the file types. Are you using like satellite data or files that you processed? You know, did some modeling operations on that, and then you upload them to the server. How do you right. do that? Right. That's a good question. So one thing we do actually is the 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 visualization is all done on the client side, but the processing of the data or generation of the tiles is happening on the server side. So for the geospatial domain, we actually have been using different tile servers. So we can use the geo server, for example. We can use geo trellis, which can actually take the net CDF and then create the tiling of that. Um, and actually, I have a video where I'll show the well data set that uh, Andrew, Peter, uh, Rama, and myself, we worked on uh, for our NASA AIST. Um, but essentially, the, the data is splitting or tiling is happening on the server side, mm -hmm. and sends data in some format to the client side, and the client side is doing all the visualizations. Um, there's one interesting thing is that, the, which I'll show later, is that all the annotations and subsetting, uh, all the data for subsetting is happening on the client side, and we send this data back to the server side, and then server does the operations on the data. Okay. So we're not moving the data across to the client side, unless we will need something from the server side. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Now I'll show a video and then call it pretty really cool So I can use both, like if I need like multi-core, you know, processing, I can use the server side right. just to visualize it on the client side. side. Yeah, because one of the challenge actually is that the client side is still is very has very basic capabilities for parallel processing. Okay. So there's something called web workers and people have been trying to utilize that, but it's not nowhere close to like what we have in team for the many core, multi core or the parallel and infrastructure. So for us to utilize the advancement in the technology, we have to do server side, that's what I don't know. But we could do all, we could do all these kind of cool things on the client side by uh, making things appear that that's, they are in parallel, but essentially they are all sequential for the most part, or asynchronous for the most part. Okay. Um, so this is something actually that came up from the um, our NASA ESP. Uh, so what actually we propose a production pipeline, uh, and this is something that um, uh, Kipper and NASA Ames um, came together with this idea is that we want to produce these production pipelines and we want to capture all the provenance. And, and by the way, we want to actually do interactive analysis for the QA operations. Uh, at the time, actually, we had an idea about like what tool we would be using. Um, but as technology changed in the last three years quite rapidly, we actually decided to use Jupyter. So Jupyter is a, something that came from Berkeley, I, I think, um, because he, uh, the founder was uh, doing his postdoc um, at the Berkeley lab, and he was looking for a way of doing these interactive um, analysis uh, where you can type some code and see the results right away, uh, potentially in a console and also in a browser. So he developed something and then um, they received a huge funding from the sources and now Jupyter has been, it used to be called IPython, uh, and Jupyter now has been adopted by the data science community at large. So it, it has been a very popular tool uh, again, open source, completely open source, that has been growing and um, and being adopted by different communities. Um, and it does have a parallel framework. So it does actually produce um, uh, or has connections to um, the um, 
multiprocessing or other parallel infrastructure that you can use on the back end. So we, we chose we chose Jupyter because of that all of these reasons, and then we extended Jupyter for our NASA ESD. So the uh, the motivation was that okay, we got this data set um, and uh, I don't want more data because that's not what we want to do as we all talked about that data is too big now. And we want to preserve the provenance and probably capture the uh, our work so we can share it with your collaborators or and use it for teaching purposes as well if we need to be. So we don't deny as a proposal and um, we say okay, we're going to do the same for the existing data set, the well data set for this example, and see how far we can push these things, uh, combining the uh, open NEX infrastructure with the geo notebook together. Um, to do this work, uh, Jupyter has these uh, extensions uh, which we actually utilize. Um, it's called client, server, and kernel. Um, so what happens actually is, this is what actually the, kind of the very high level um, stack looks like. So you have these notebook cells, which are these, um, kind of like a, these um, rectangular elements in a browser where you can type some code, um, which could be Python, Julia, R, um, could be C++ actually as well, it's possible extended for any language. And then that Basically, the data what we're typing goes to the web server, which sends that, that string to the, the kernel, which is running all the time, or listening for these things. Um, it's using something called zero MQ, which basically just means of like transferring data from server to the kernel. And then from the kernel, it basically gets the string and kind of into a Python or the R. So it knows that there's a Python code, this is R code. And, and basically, it stores the state of that. In the on the server side. So, what happened actually for our AIST, we had to extend the client because we wanted to produce a show a geospatial view. We had to extend the server because we were hoping to provide a tile server so we can, can show large the visual. Area. And then um, we had to extend the kernel to provide an API for the scientists so that they can actually use very simple API in the notebook environment to do uh, analytics on the large data set as well. So this is a more complete diagram here. I, I won't go into much detail, but essentially what happens is that you type a code on the notebook cells that goes to the kernel, kernel passes information to the uh, your client side JavaScript code, which is showing the map. Um, and if you're actually asking some large data to be visualized that sends back to a tile server, uh, which actually knows where the data is, and then it, it basically renders all those tiles, you know, you know, giving those tiles back to the map. So it's, it's a complicated system for non-developers, but they essentially, um, it gives you a lot of flexibility and how and what tools you want to use uh, in, a bigger, uh, in a bigger sense. So, um, and the user actually does not know all these details. The user actually does see that after type some code, I get data or tiles on my map view. Again, this is a bit more uh, detailed diagram. Again, I won't go into it unless from the, um, maybe I want to ask them later, but essentially this is all the components that are involved. And, and you can see that we, uh, our team actually, um, Tickware and our AIC team at NASA, uh, we pretty much use all the open source tools, so you can switch and use different tools if you need to be, but uh, we pick these tools as they fit into the system. So we have the support for um, raster dataset, vector datasets, um, we can do VIF dataset and SEDF, uh, it's an open Apache 2 license. Um, we have Docker image for easy deployment and um, there's some ongoing work that we have been doing. Uh, there's something called Asvera, and they actually have been working on something called GeoTrellis. Um, and they actually have a lot of YouTube videos that they have shown on the uh, NEX data set. Um, so we use GeoTrellis, and we shown some interesting results, which actually uh, got their attention as well. So they are now working with us 
stunning geo network uh, for their use cases, um, for their grant. Um, they're, they're very happy to see this kind of collaboration where we took their open source tool um, and we put our own open source tool on top of that and showcase that we can do this kind of directed QA um, over the web. So where's the source code? So the source code is um, is an open geoscience. That's the portfolio I maintain. Um, and we have GeoNet there, the documentation, and there's a channel for if you want to talk to people, um, the developers, and ask any questions. And with this, I actually have a video. So basically, what, what we are see, showing here actually is a different kind of data sets first. So this is the uh, Netherlands Power data set. And it's 20 gigabyte data set, not too big. Uh, but you can see that we can quickly um, produce all this uh, tiling on the server side, and we can do visualization of that. This is the SRTM data set. It's a little bigger, 80 gigabyte, and you can, again, um, look at this data set very quickly over the map. Uh, zoom in, zoom out. Um, again, just like showing me that we can render this data set very large. This is the well data set, um, and again, you can see that this is a little bigger data set now. Um, 300 gigabyte, and you can still do interactive visualization of these things. Now, we want to do more than visualization. So now we want to do actually is that we want to load the 1.5 terabyte uh, world data set, and now we want to subset that data set. Um, so here in this code, you can see that um, we're going to create a rectangular region by creating animation here. So the idea here is that you find something interesting days or anomaly there and you want to look into the data set more closely so you can actually get that annotation data set as numpy array on the client side or at least on your cell and now you get the same image here and then you can do some processing on that so you can actually do segmentation, some anomaly detection, um, some QA checking if you have some QA algorithm on, or anything like that. Um, so again, this is the Idea is that how quickly you can subset 1.5 terabyte data set, a small chunk of that, get the data on the client side, and now we can do, use any tool you have on Python or potentially in R as well. You run that on the code, on the data, and then create the result for your team. Um, this is again from showing some other data set um, and, and the visualization capabilities here. Um, and since we can get these animations or multiple animations on the screen, we can do time series plotting, um, uh, comparisons um, of different regions. Uh, so as far as far like what we can do with this particular framework, the there's no limit because the data is given to you. It's all in Python, um, and you can extend this thing to for language as well. So as far as those things are concerned. You can you can essentially um, you can essentially uh, create or run your own pipeline, and that was the biggest motivating factor is that since we are working in the Python ecosystem, you can use existing code. You don't have to like um, use our API once you get past this data or the interactive QA sessions. So maybe you can highlight one one quick thing. Sure. Also, the, the underlying tiles here are all at this point raster, or can they be raster or SVG? These are now all raster. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, here you can see actually a data object that has come to the client, so you can operate and perform functions and send it back up. You know, so as he executes you know, this cell, you get the actual data object itself in the, in the non array. So, and if you have, you know, Python has a lot of different tools, right? You can yeah. operate on that locally. And do oh, interesting sure. things. Makes sense. And this is necessary with Python 3, or it doesn't matter what it does? It does, actually, um, there, there's one part which does not work with Python 3, but for the most part, it is Python 3 compatible. Oh, but if I have, I'm okay with <coughs> Will be okay. Will be okay. Because like I saw the three. Yes. No. It, it, it <laughs> they be okay. have weird. Yeah. Yeah. It will be okay. Because we. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, I mean, we, we are actually moving to Python 3, but the idea would be that we can still support Python 2 okay. uh, as a type of compatible thing. Okay. Because uh, some people and some tools have not been ported to Python 3 yet. Okay. So that has been a challenge um, for the community at large to support Python 2 and Python 3. And our goal is to support both of these Python versions. So these examples, I think, are per pixel sorts of operations. Um, are there, how fast is it with multi-pixel operations like segmentation? Um, so this is per chunk as opposed to pixel, I think, right? Well, the, the actual resulting value in any given raster cell is just dependent on the input raster cell. Sure, Dylan. So, but if you, you have, time, yeah, if you were doing segmentation, you were looking at neighborhoods mm -hmm. or, you know, regions. That's a good question. So, one thing actually is, I would say is that what you see on the screen here, so you do actually like this animation region that you want to pick. Mm -hmm. We actually didn't pick these data that you're seeing on the screen. We picked the data actually that you, that's on the disk somewhere. So, the the uh, data clipping operation is happening on the raw data. So the raw data is in that CDF for the raster or it's in the vector format. You get that data as NumPy array back to you on your Python cells. And then once you get the data, the segmentation or other clustering operations you're doing, that's, that's up to the end user. Because we don't do anything at, at that point. Because once we give that back to you, you can do whatever you want with that data. And then if there are multiple layers um, there, then we can give you the multiple uh, or multi-dimensional or n-dimensional array back to you. Um, now, if you need to like look at the like we call them host cells, like the region around your segmentation, we could add that feature as very easily. Where you can say add like a two more layers or two more um, uh, naming cells to the annotation that user has drawn. Actually, right now it does give you that. In fact, it gives you the um, it gives you the um, the area around the your annotation as well. Uh, so it does give you the, the kind of flexibility to give you more data than what you have selected, or just exactly the same region that you have selected back to the user. Mm -hmm. So if you have an existing kind of Python library that does some of the segmentation, something like SK learn, you can apply that to the n dimensional array and do segmentation. So you may see, see the result on that chunk in one piece itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I mean, if you go to the GitHub site, we do a screenshot, but we do a very poor segmentation, so please uh, don't judge by that. <laughs> Like, if you go to GitHub or open your sign oh, yeah. So the tool is based on when I'm uploading stuff, let's say what happens if I'm working with R to do some of the data processing. Can I do it like in line in the notebook or would I need to? So the so the notebook actually is what, that's a very interesting thing of the notebook and I, I think that's one of the revolution now I'd say. Um, so the notebook actually supports different kind of kernels. Mm -hmm. So we use a Python mm -hmm. kernel. Okay. But they do have an R kernel actually as well. So the only limitation is that you can't combine R and Python in the same kernel right now. But you can actually run our code in the Jupyter in the geo, environment. In the Geo notebook or? Not in the Geo notebook okay. right now. Okay. But in the Jupyter okay. kernel. Okay. So you're talking about this, right? Yeah, so we go to the uh, screenshots here. But we can actually run our code in Jupyter notebook using, using uh, or in Geo notebook using pi 2 r or pi r 2 Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, so you can actually, there's already a library that's out there and has been utilized by people for a long time. Okay. Um, it's called pi 2 or pi r 2 I forgot that name. Okay. You can involve your R code R code inside on. the, okay. Right. So, in this case, you get the data from GeoNotebook as an array, you can pass an array to R code and they can do your R analytics on that. Okay. 
The pattern why actually is very friendly ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, other languages with the could be barrier, but in pattern why is an easy, easy um, transition, I guess. Um, so um, if you go down a bit. So we're showing the NDVI and geospatial reference here. Um, <coughs> this is our initial experimentation, and you can see it, how well it's aligned. You can change the color map of these things. So this comes with the icon of the default, but you can change it to any color map that you have using Mathlab color map or some other color map that you want to create for your own. Um, we go down on the uh, This is showing the um, um, a poor segmentation, I would say. Um, yeah, actually, not before. It's actually in the contours. Yeah. It's reasonable. Using SKN, which is a standard open source library. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're just using the socket image there. And actually, if you go down a bit more, these are the time series we have done. So these are the three um, annotations that users uploaded using probably a shape file or vector file. And then you can get the data from each of these chunks and you can draw a time series plot using Matplotlib. So again, um, we don't restrict people what tool they want to use. Uh, they use a plot type or something like that, and so they keep using it. So this is a, this is a very like uh, our poor segmentation. Um, and um, I don't know what tool we use for this particular thing. I'm pretty sure it's like psychic image. Um, but basically, we did some we did the area selection here, got the data from Wiley, and then we do the segmentation on that, and then we show it as map plot. plot. So, um, yeah, so the, the limits essentially in the Python world is, is uh, uh, from our point of view, there's no limit. You can, you can bring your own tool, you can bring your algorithm. Uh, all we're doing basically is giving you the infrastructure and then the UI uh, for the back end that lets you look at the data set very quickly, do segmentation, uh, the uh, clipping, some settings. Um, and, and other operations from the QA point of view, and once you get your data, you can do what, you need to be, uh, what needs to be done for your project. Um, but that's the thing I would like to conclude my uh, session, and uh, thank you so much for listening to my talk. Um, if you have any questions, I'm going to be here for the next few hours. Um, and uh, the Open Geoscience is the on GitHub. Uh, we have other projects listed. Uh, if you have any questions on the interview, I was more than happy to connect with the right people, um, whether it's National Lab or the architecture. And um, the last thing I want to mention is that um, we have been really pushing very hard on the Jupyter infrastructure actually at Kipfer. And I would encourage uh, you all to look into the Jupyter Lab, which is a newer version of Jupyter that's coming out very soon, uh, or maybe sometime soon, I would say.